Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is entitled Themes in the Gospel of John. Now, I hope that you're very familiar with the Gospel of John. It is certainly a core section of the Bible. It helps us to tie the beginning to the end and so forth. This particular lesson, number 12 in our series for December 21 of 2024, is entitled The Hour of Glory, The Cross and Resurrection. The cross? Does that sound like glory? Well, let's see what we can learn. Let's pray. Our wonderful Father, as we think once again of the marvelous things that you accomplished in that short three and a half years that we could tolerate you here on this earth, we are reminded that this continues to affect each one of us every day. May we come to be more like you as a result of our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> this lesson covers a time from Jesus' appearance before Pilate. So we're not going to go way back. We're going to pick up sort of in the middle of the trials until he revealed himself to Mary after his resurrection. So we've lots of important stuff right in that, in that period. Jim? From the Bible study guide, Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection are the climax of John. The first 10 chapters cover roughly three and a half years, chapters 11 to 20. In contrast, cover about one to two weeks from the Bible study guide. And I might add that that's true of most of the rest of the Gospels as well. That last week was absolutely the focus. And everything else is a lead up to it, and then boom. And so, John is kind of extra emphasis on the, the last couple, last well, few days, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, but all the other, I mean, every one of the Gospels, about half of them, about half of the length of the Gospel is on that last week. Mm. Each of the four Gospels has a different emphasis. Jennifer? So from the Bible study guide, the four Gospels present the death of Jesus in different ways. Though their accounts are compatible, each author emphasizes key points that especially resonate with the themes of his gospel. Matthew emphasizes the fulfillment of scripture. Mark emphasizes the parallel between the baptism of Jesus and the cross. And Luke focuses on the cross as healing and salvation, the story of the thief on the cross. But John presents the cross as the enthronement of Jesus, particularly tied to the idea of the hour, which is referred to numerous times throughout the book. You can look at John 7, 8, and chapters 12. This idea of enthronement is an ironic picture since crucifixion was the most ignominious and shameful way to die that the Romans used. So what was the purpose of crucifixion? from their one's perspective? Humiliation. To absolutely humiliate anybody who supposedly was a threat to the government. Go ahead. This contrast points to the deeply ironic depiction that John presents. Jesus is dying in shame, but it is, at the same time, his glorious enthronement as a savior. Amen. Throughout the Gospel of John, we have seen that Jesus <laughs> represented truth and light. Jesus had repeatedly said to his followers that his time and not, had not yet come. I see that and had not yet come, had not, should be had not. But now after his arrest, his time had, had come. After grilling Jesus through the five trials, the Jewish leaders took him to Pilate early in the morning. And that's where we pick up our story. After the Jewish leaders indicate that they thought Jesus deserved to die, Pilate asked Jesus if he was the king of the Jews. They're indirectly questioning why the Jews were bringing Jesus to him for trial. I mean, if, you re if he's really the king and you are the religious leaders and now you're bringing him to be tried, what are you saying? I mean, obviously, you don't recognize him as a king of you. So what, do we, what does the word say? John 18. Pilate went back into the palace and called Jesus. Are you the king of the Jews? He asked him. Jesus answered, Does this question come from you, or have others told you about me? Pilate replied, Do you think I'm a Jew? 
It was your own people and the chief priests who handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus said, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom belonged to this world, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish authorities. No, my kingdom does not belong here. So Pilate asked him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say I'm a king. I was born and came into the world for this one purpose, to speak about the truth. Whoever belongs to the truth listens to me. And what is truth, Pilate said. So then Pilate went back outside to the people and said to them, I can't find any, any reason to condemn him. What did he, you know, I wish we had a, a, a video of that encounter. Because, I mean, you, you wouldn't immediately jump to the conclusion that, that Pilate did from just the words we have here. Obviously, he recognized that this wasn't the typical criminal. So why do you suppose Pilate was anxious to find out if Jesus was a king? Well, it would be competition. Yeah, those of us who have read the book of John already know the answer to that. Jesus tried to get a little deeper into the conversation, but Pilate responded with an evasion. Myra? Bible study guide. In the brief but significant interaction between the two, Jesus told Pilate that he had come to this world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who, who is of the truth hears my voice, John 18, 37. The vacillating pilot had never heard anyone talk about the truth in such a certain and authoritative manner. In response, Pilate then asked this timeless question, what is truth? John 18, 38. Pilate, however, did not wait for Jesus' answer to that critical question. We can only imagine that Christ's answer might have been what Christ's answer might have been, ha, might have been if he had the opportunity to answer. Yeah, that would have been nice, wouldn't it? Yeah. What do you think? Did do, Pil do you think that? All the Jews, you know, I'm thinking, did they understand the, the Messiah was going to come as their savior from sin? No. Or they... They were sure that he was going to come to save them from the Romans. So even in the Old Testament, when we talk about the Messiah coming, this is what they... Well, if you look carefully at the predictions in the Old Testament you'll find that there, most of them talk about his first coming. He was born and he's, where is he going to be born and so forth like that. And those are pretty straightforward. There are a few places in Zechariah and a few other places that talk about things which we assign to the second coming or even to the third coming. And the Jews grabbed onto those prophecies and tried to put those back at his first coming. So the, about the glorious appearing in the skies and so forth, that kind of stuff, they wanted that to happen at the first coming, and they, they wanted all of it to happen in the first coming. I mean, it's hard to sort out. I mean, this really is a lot of prophecies. You could only figure it out in retrospect. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you can't, but, but they were looking, so I guess the distinction was they didn't like this meek, mild-mannered approach. They wanted a heavy hand. Uh, against their enemies. Yeah. And so yeah. when, it, when Jesus pointed out that this is an internal process that I've come to uh, encourage here, they didn't want to deal with it at that level, is, yeah. is how I interpret it. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, for sure. It's interesting because if you go to the New Testament, they, almost all the prophecies in the New Testament point to the second coming. You don't learn about the third coming until you get to the very end of the book of Revelation and the only one of the disciples that's still alive is John. So Paul never knew about the millennium. He never knew about the third coming. Neither did any of the other disciples except John. And why God 
arrange things that way. Well, you don't need information until you're ready to yeah. receive it. Yeah. They weren't ready to. Until you need it. Un so it. what do you think Pilate thought? Did he have questions about what kind of person Jesus was? Clearly he did. He certainly disagreed with the evaluation of the Jewish religious leaders. From the Bible study guide, could it be that we emulate Pilate's impatience? We ask God some good questions, but we frequently do not wait for his answers. Mm -hmm. How often mm. do we wait for his answer? Yeah. I want it and I want it now how different our lives would be if we would listen more to what God has to say. Unfortunately, we are too often self-focused and not Christ-centered. Imagine all the helpful insights God might give us if we would simply be still and listen to him more from the wow. Bible study guide. That's a terrible indictment, isn't it? After their conversation, Pilate did his best to try to figure out how to get Jesus released. And of course, there was that message from his wife that we don't, they didn't bother to talk about in this situation. He certainly had the authority to just, I mean, he had the authority. He could have just said, I think this man is innocent, finished. Mm. Send him out. But he played with the Jewish leaders because he did not want to offend them. Thus he lost, and why didn't he want to offend them? He was worried about his own is self. It? his own position. Thus he lost his advantage. At that point, the mockery and shaming of Jesus began. They placed a crown of thorns on his head and put a purple kingly robe on him. They greeted him as if he were the emperor. Unfortunately, the Jewish religious leaders had set up the mob, inciting, incited by their leaders, the mob began to cry for Jesus to be crucified. John 19, six through 16. When the chief priests and the temple guards saw him, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, you take him then, crucify him. I find no reason to condemn him. The crowd answered back, we have a law that says he ought to die because he claimed to be the son of God. Now, if you stop and think about how ridiculous that is, I mean, the, the whole Jewish nation said, what are they waiting for? They're waiting for the Son of God to come and help them. And now they want him to, this person to be crucified because... But didn't he, they have lots of people who claim to be God? Well, yeah, but the, not quite like this one. <laughs> didn't have quite the authority this one did. No. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. He went back into the palace and asked Jesus, where do you come from? But Jesus did not answer. Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Remember, I have the authority to set you free and also to have you crucified. Jesus answered, you have authority over me only because it was given to you by God. So the man who handed me over to you is guilty of a worse sin. When Pilate heard this, he tried to find out a way, to find a way to set Jesus free. But the crowd shouted back, if you set him free, that means that you are not the emperor's friend. Anyone who claims to be a king is a rebel against the emperor. Oh boy. When Pilate heard these words, he took Jesus outside and sat, sat down on the judge's seat in the palace called the stone pavement. In the, in, in the Hebrew, the word is, ga, is Gabbatha. Uh, it was then almost noon of the day before the Passover. Pilate sat, said to the people, I'm sorry, he, here is your king. They shouted back, kill him, kill him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, do you want me to crucify your king? The chief priest answered, the only king we have is the emperor. I mean, if that isn't... <laughs> then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. I mean, I hope they were biting their tongues really hard. From our Bible study guide, Jim. How scary, a pagan ruler wants to release Jesus while the spiritual leaders of the nation who should have recognized him wanted him crucified instead. What lesson can we take from this for ourselves in the Bible study guide? How could this situation apply to us? Are we ever tempted to go along with peer pressure, the pressure from our associates, instead of standing firm for the truth? Hmm. 
how are they going to stand firm for the truth if they don't know what the truth is? Well, I mean, well they knew it. Their conscience told them that they didn't want to make the they, truth. They knew what they were supposed to do. Right. At least Pilate was firm enough in his convictions that he refused to be bullied any further by pressure from those religious leaders regarding the sign placed on Jesus' cross. Jennifer? From John chapter 19, verses 17 to 22. He, Jesus, went out carrying his cross and came to the place of the skull, as it is called. In Hebrew, it is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and they also crucified two other men, one on each side with Jesus between them. Pilate wrote a notice and had it put on the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, is what he wrote. Many people read it because the place where Jesus was crucified was not far from the city. The notice was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. Wow. The chief priest said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather, this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written stays written. Yes, and amen to that. Yeah. Okay, Mickey? Oh, any, was there any um, deeper meaning to the place of the skull? Or that's just, that was just a place name? Well, there's an interesting place, um, which is now a bus station uh, in Jerusalem that if you look at it, it looks like the face of a skull. And some people believe that that was the place. Uh, I don't know if that's true. It's not far from, from the place. You know, there's two places where Christians believe Jesus was crucified and buried. One is in the, just inside the city wall, um, as where many of the Christians believe was Jesus actually was, was crucified, and probably it's the correct place. The other place is just outside the city wall a little ways. It's come to be called the Garden Tomb, and that place, um, so-called experts say that that place wasn't created until two, two or three centuries after Jesus was here on this earth. So he's probably, and the problem with, with the, the inside place that people really believe was where Jesus was crucified and died, it's been so, you know, I don't even know how to describe it, you know, with lanterns all over the place and huge cathedrals and, and this section is for this and another section is for that and someone else is for this and so forth like this and this church claims, I mean, they even divide up how many lanterns that this church can have here and how many lanterns that church can have there and it's, it's so. All these, as my understanding that it was um, Constantine's mother that went to Jerusalem and said, well, so where did this, Happened. They said, "Well, it was probably here," and so they yeah. built a church, and then, and so it's all, you know, been changed over. Well, they they might have been correct, and yeah. they, maybe they weren't. Or built a big church rather than leave it like yeah. it was. All right. So, all my comments on this: a higher power than Pilate or the Jews had directed the placing of that inscription above the head of Jesus. In the providence of God, it was to awaken thought and investigation of the scriptures. The place where Christ was crucified was near to the city. So that indicates, what, more just, of the outside one? Just, well, no. The old city, anyway. Yeah, just outside, yeah, they, oh, the old city. Okay. Thousands of people from all lands were then at Jerusalem, and the inscription declaring Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, would come to their notice. It was a living truth transcribed by a hand that God had guided. From Desire of Ages 745. And I don't know, I'm probably crazy because I've obviously worked in many different places in the world and learned different languages and so forth, but when I see a sign with three <coughs> languages, I. Okay, let's see if I can figure out how, how does this one relate to that one. And I'm sure there were a lot of people, and even kids, oh, look at that sign. I wonder what, let's see, I can read that line. What is that one, and what does that one mean? Mm -hmm. I'm sure God had his hand in that. While there were several of the faithful, uh, 
female followers of Jesus at the cross, where were most of his disciples? Cowering. Locked behind doors. Yeah. Bible study guide comments. Among those standing at the foot of the cross that, that day were John, the beloved <laughs> disciple, along with Mary and the mother of Jesus and others. Many years before, Simon had predicted, Simon, Simeon. Simeon. Simeon had predicted this very experience when Joseph and Mary brought Jesus to the temple to dedicate him in Luke. Now, in his dying moments, Jesus speaks of his mother. Woman, behold your son. To John, he says, behold your mother. And let me just assure you that when it says woman there, behold your, your son, that's a, that's a word that was, was also used to mean mother. So mother, behold your son. You could see that that would make more sense. It wasn't, your, your emphasis, it wasn't a disrespectful no. depiction, it was a tender one. Yes. Yeah. When Jesus on the cross said, it is finished, what was it that was finished? What did Jesus actually come to this earth to do? As we have suggested on several occasions, Jesus, his primary task was to represent God the Father correctly, not only to us, but also to the entire universe. Jesus came to answer questions that had been raised in the Garden of Eden after having been raised in heaven prior to Lucifer's open rebellion. And just look at a couple of passages from Scripture. Ephesians 1, 7 to 10, For by the blood of Christ we are set free, that is, our sins are forgiven. How great is the grace of God, which He gave to us in such large measure. Okay. In all his wisdom and insight, God did what he had purposed and made known to us the secret plan he had already decided to complete by means of Christ. This plan, which God will complete when the time is right, is to bring all creation together, everything in heaven and on earth with Christ as head. Okay, so how many people are involved? All. The entire universe. Okay. okay. Place Ellen White talks about millions of worlds. Yeah. Quote, millions of worlds. Okay, you want to move on to Colossians there as well? Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For it was by God's own decision that the Son has in himself the full nature of God. Through the Son, then, God decided to bring the whole universe back to himself, not just humans. God made peace through his Son's blood on the cross and so brought back to himself all things, both on earth and in heaven. Good News Bible. So the idea that Jesus died to pay the price for sin, would, how would that impact the universe? They weren't sinners. So it has to be bigger, much bigger than that. So can I read some of those? So from Ellen White, um, several interesting, so from the sixth uh, Bible commentary, the atonement of Christ is not a mere skillful way to have our sins pardoned. It's a divine remedy for the cure of transgression and the restoration of spiritual health. Another place, uh, 7 BC. The plan of redemption is not merely a way of escape from the penalty of transgression, mm -hmm. but through it, the sinner is forgiven his sins and will finally be received into heaven, not as a forgiven culprit, pardoned and released from captivity, yet looked upon with suspicion and not admitted to friendship and trust, but welcomed as a child and taken back into full confidence." Wow. Okay, so what could the universe have learned from the death of Jesus? We need to go back to the Garden of Eden and see how this all developed on this earth. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. You may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is, evil, what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. God is the only source of life. When we sin, we are choosing to separate ourselves from that only source of life. The final result of this separation is called the second death. Isaiah 59, verse 2. Jim? It is because of your sins that He doesn't hear you. It is your sins that separate you from God when you try to worship Him. 
interpreted his Bible. Do you agree with the Bible study guide regarding what the re, uh, mission of Jesus was, or was it much deeper than that? And here's, here's in a statement. See what you think. Jennifer? <clears throat> From the Bible study guide. Jesus' mission was to be sacrificed as the Paschal Lamb, slain from the foundations of the world. He was born to die, but his death did not need to be at the hands of Pilate. Pilate's final words to the crowd were, Behold the man. From John 19.5. Okay, how many of us were born to die? How many of us will die? It's all <laughs> except those who see the second coming. Yeah, exactly. So, or are translated. What does that mean? Yeah, where did they where did they come up with that idea? Mm. Well, there are some places in Scripture that kind of give that idea. But Jesus, Jesus never addressed the issue. Yeah, did he, he says, "For this reason, I was born to bear witness to the truth." Yeah. Many p people believe. Now, let's get to this. Let's be clear. Many people believe that Jesus came to this earth to die on the cross to pay the price for our sins. Paganism. To whom would he pay it? Who, who, who's demanding that a price be paid? All legal systems are pagan. If that is true, then what Jesus said in his prayer to his Father, as recorded in John 17, 4, cannot be true because he had not yet paid the price by dying. Thus, in that view, he had not yet finished the work that the Father had given him to do. So he was lying. Oh dear. By that view. The Bible tells us clearly that God's wrath or anger is his turning away and loving disappointment from those who do not want him anyway, thus uh, leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own persistent rebellious choices. And there's a whole handout on that. Yeah, does God really need to turn? Can he just watch him go? Is it, well, he, 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 it's not that he can't bear it, the yeah, thought it, it, of the appearance of them leaving. They just go. Yeah. He, he doesn't restrain them, well, call them in to scare the daylights helps, out of them. I think it helps to, so what is the actual lesion? What's the actual problem? So is it a, a, is it a legal problem <coughs> or is it a relationship problem? A refusal to listen. Mark. Yeah. So, so if we it's put this all in relational terms, then to me it makes more sense. Yeah. Jesus died the death which is a, dif which is a direct result of sin. He did not die of beatings, blood loss, a heart attack, a stroke, or cancer. He died the death that sinners will die in the end if they refuse to separate from their sins. It was the death that Adam and Eve had been warned against uh, warned about back in the Garden of Eden. Okay, whose turn is it now? That's fine. Okay. The wrath of God against sin, or the disruption of the relationship. Yeah. The pain of God, if you want to say it that way. The terrible manifestation of his displeasure or disappointment because of iniquity filled the soul of his son with consternation. Let me interrupt for a second. Remember, I, the way I look at this is God is angry about sin because of what it does to his children. And then as, they were, as Jesus was entering Jerusalem, he started sobbing. Mm -hmm. Same thing. And Ellen White said it wasn't because of his fear of dying or anything. No. It was because he realized that he was not getting through mm -hmm. to them and, and there was nothing more he could do to win them yep. back. Exactly. And so this, how can I let you go? Mm -hmm. How can I give you up idea? So he was profoundly touched by the fact that he couldn't get through. Exactly. So to me, that's like, yeah. wow. All his life, Christ had been publishing to a fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme. But now on the cross with the terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face, even though he was right there. Yeah. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior is this hour of supreme, in this hour of supreme anguish, pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man or others. Human, by, any by human beings. Or, or maybe even angels? Maybe. 
So great was his agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. And I always try to, I'm sorry for interrupting again, but I always try to struggle when I read passages like this. You know, we tend to think, okay, here's three crosses, there's a couple of criminals there, and there's Jesus being crucified, and there's a few people standing around making this and that. No, the entire universe full of angels, God and all of his people on his side, and Satan and all of his people on his side are there, and they're, I don't know whether they're physically at both, both. I mean, this is the critical battle of the great controversy. It's interesting, I think his early writings where some of the angels were, were going to try to help, and they had to be restrained by their, by their uh, yep. supervisors. Yep. <laughs> you remember that one? Yeah. So, um, all right. So great was the agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. Wow. And Jesus died before the other people who were being crucified. Mm -hmm. and so, because they didn't break his leg. No. Because the way that they died was by asphyxiation. And so they would break the leg so they couldn't push themselves up to get a deep breath mm -hmm. and, and then would stay down, compressing their lungs and not able to get a deep breath. But and he had so, already died when they came to break his leg. Yeah. Sometimes it took three days. Wow. Okay, go ahead. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb, so hope did not present to him his coming forth in the grave of conqueror. So he, he felt this was eternal separation from God. And, and that's, that's what, what the second death is all about. Right. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal felt that he was so identified with sin yeah. that that would force God to not be able to take him back. And I think he recognized <coughs> at that point that this they, was what they had agreed upon that was going to happen before he left heaven. Before he left heaven, they made these plans. Okay? So, so that's where, for me, you could argue that, so there's a verse that says that we were made for God's own pleasure. Mm -hmm. So he's, it's more fun to play with, you know, well, dolls no. that could respond than <laughs> dolls not what that, that are means. programmed. But the fact that he committed himself yeah. to the solution then gives the lie that he's just doing it out of selfishness. Exactly. So they, they said, we have to see this thing all, we, we don't have to, but we want to see this thing all the way through because yeah. we want to, we want you guys to be free and have true freedom of choice, and we're not going to uh, force you to that. We're going we're gonna to persuade you and demonstrate to you that we want to be your friends and yep. have a collaborating relationship, not a authoritative one. So that's how I put it together. Yeah. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race, or it's no longer effective. Hmm. It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath or separation upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. The sense of sin is what killed him. Sense of separation. Look carefully at these words. Jesus did not say, God, why are you killing me? Instead, Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why did you abandon me? Did God the Father abandon Jesus at the cross? Let's look at some other passages. Right there. We turn to consider the universe-wide implications of Jesus' death. On the cross, Jesus was experiencing separation from God. That is what broke his heart and killed him. That is exactly what will kill the wicked in the end. Although God was right there at the cross, Jesus could not see him or feel him in the way he had seen and felt God's presence throughout his life that was separation from God. Jesus, of course, was not a sinner. However, God realized that he must demonstrate to us the seriousness of sin so that we can make right choices in our lives. The death that results from sin is called the second death. If any of us die that death, we will be dead for the rest of eternity. 
However, because of his divinity, Jesus was able to arise after dying that awful death. Thus, we can have some idea of how serious sin is. So, so I would say that's why Jesus had to die, was to demonstrate well, the consequences of, of uh, not, not being connected to God. Yeah. I recently heard one of my friends give a sermon which really impacted me. I, I love this explanation. He said, when, when the, after that cleansing of the temple, he said, you know, destroy this temple and three days I will build it up again. And another place he said, I have the power to lay down my life. I have the power to take it up again. And so Jesus was saying to them, and that, that came after they said to him, what, have, what, what power, what authority do you have to do these things? And he said, well, kill me and then you'll see what happens. And so he, he says, the answer to that question is the sign of Jonah. What was the sign of Jonah? Well, so Jonah was effectively dead down there in the belly of the, and he said so, I'm in Sheol, which is the place of the dead. But then he was spit out on the, on the so forth and came back to life. Jesus says, you kill me, I will be dead for three days, then I will prove to you that I have the authority to give life. And so when he came up out of the grave on that third day, there is no basis for anybody saying that he, he, he didn't have that ability. He didn't. I mean, no one but God could do that. You want to know what authority I have? I'm God. How do I prove it? Rising from the dead on the third day. Okay. So in the life and death of Jesus gives us a choice. One, we can choose to follow his example in life and live forever. Or two, we can die the way he died, not of beating or crucifixion, but of separation from his father. If we die that second death, we will be dead forever. Eventually, God must allow the wicked to reap the natural results of consequences of their own evil choices. He cannot allow sinners to enter heaven because one, they would just st start the great controversy over again, and two, for the wicked to live in heaven would be torture. Myra, that very special quotation. From the great controversy. Could those whose lives have been spent in rebellion against God be suddenly transported to heaven and witness the high and holy state of perfection that ever exists there. Every soul filled with love, every countenance beaming with joy, enrapturing music in melodious strains, rising in honor of God and the Lamb, and seeing ceaseless streams of light flowing into the redeemed from the face of him who sitteth on the throne. Could those whose hearts be filled with hatred of God. Are filled with hatred of God. Are filled with hatred of God, of truth and holiness, mingle with the heavenly throng and join in their songs of praise. Could they endure the glory of God and the Lamb? No. No, years of probation were granted them that they might form characters for heaven, but they have never trained the mind to love purity. They have never learned the language of heaven, and now it is too late. The life of rebellion against God has unfitted them for heaven. Its purity, holiness, and peace could be torture to them. Whoa. Read that again? Yes. Is purity, holiness, and peace. That is, the, here, yeah. the holiness and peace of heaven would be torture, torture for the wicked. Go ahead. The glory of God would be a consuming fire. They could not flee from the holy they place. They would long to flee. They would long to, yes, they would long to flee. They would welcome destruction that they might be hidden from the face of him who died to redeem them. The destiny of the wicked is fixed by their own choice. Their ex ex exclusion. exclusion from heaven is voluntary with themselves and just and merciful on the part of God. Voluntary. Well, what? It's voluntary. Yeah, yeah it's there voluntary. it is. So here's yeah. another one, Acts of the Apostles 273. The refining influence of the grace of God 
changes the natural disposition of men. Heaven would not be desirable to the carnal-minded. Their natural, unsanctified hearts would feel no attraction toward that pure and holy place. And if it were possible for them to enter, they would find there nothing congenial. Wow. Be actually torture, it said. We it just read. Hell. Heaven would be hell yeah. for those that don't want to be there. But now, to, to try to make so that we don't think God is a bad, a bad, bad ogre or something like that, read the next quotation. This is from Desire of Ages. Well, the prior one was Great Controversy 542. <coughs> now, Desire of Ages 764. This is not an act of arbitrary power on the part of God. The rejecters of his mercy reap that which they have sown. God is the fountain of life, and when one chooses the service of sin, he separates from God and thus cuts himself off from life. He is alienated from the life of God. Christ says, all they that hate me love death. Their verse is given. God gives them existence for a time that they may develop their character and reveal their principles. This accomplished, they receive the results of their own choice. By a life of rebellion, Satan and all who unite with him place themselves so out of harmony with God that his very presence is to them a consuming fire. The glory of him who is love will destroy them. Wow. Desire of Ages 764. Here's a nuance from Last Day Events 242. I was shown that the judgments of God would not come directly out from the Lord upon them. Mm -hmm. But in this way, they place themselves beyond his protection. Yep. Another one, five, uh, fifth, uh, five testimonies, 120. God destroys no one. The sinner destroys himself by his own impenitence. We want all to understand how the soul is destroyed. It is not that God sends out a decree that man shall not be saved. Yeah, exactly. Returning to the Jesus' death on the cross, what an irony. The greatest war ever fought in the universe was won by the death of the champion. Is it possible to win a war by dying? Mm -hmm. Christ did. It is interesting to note that the crucifixion, the most shameful and humiliating death, is presented by John as the most glorious event. By his death, Jesus as the second Adam defeated, Adam, uh, defeated Satan, I'm sorry, accomplishing the mission of saving sinful humanity. With Jesus' mission of salvation accomplished, his father accepted his sacrifice and made it possible for all who, be who believed in his son to be saved. From the Bible Study Guide 158. Soon after the death of Jesus, the women and others went home to prepare for the Sabbath. Luke 23, 56. Then they went back to home and prepared the spices and perfumes for the body. On the Sabbath they rested, as the law commanded. Mark 16, 1. After the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, and Salome brought spices to, to, to go and anoint the body of Jesus. The Roman soldiers were guarding the tomb, allegedly to prevent the dis disciples from stealing his body and saying that he had been raised to life. At Jesus' grave, the contingent of Roman soldiers saw the angels descend from heaven and they fell like dead men. Hmm. We do not know if the soldiers actually saw Jesus come forth from the tomb, but they fled. From of the desire of ages, when the voice of the mighty angel <coughs> was heard at Christ's tomb, saying, Thy Father calls thee, the Savior came forth from the grave by the life that was in himself. Now is proved the truth of his words, I lay down my life, that I might take it again. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. Now is fulfilled the prophecy he had spoken to the priests and rulers, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. From that's, 10, 17 and 18. that's the sign of Jonah right there. And then the empty tomb. Mm. Mickey? Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, <coughs> Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been taken away from the entrance. She went running to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved, John, and told them, they've taken the Lord from the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. 
Then Peter and the other disciple went to the tomb. The two of them were running. But the other disciple ran faster than Peter and reached the tomb first. He was that, younger, of course. Okay. <laughs> Don't have he, to be younger to run faster. <laughs> but it helps. He bent over and saw the linen wrappings, but he did not go in. Behind him came Simon Peter, and he went straight into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth which had been around Jesus' head. It was not lying with the linen wrappings, but was rolled up by itself. Any significance that we ascribe to that? We're going we're gonna to get to it in just a moment. Right. Myra? From the Bible study guide, Jesus died late on Friday afternoon and rose early on Sunday. Because the Sabbath was near when he was buried, the burial process was done hastily and not completely. However much of... However much they loved Jesus. Yeah, however much they loved Jesus, they followed... His followers kept the Sabbath day and did not go into the tomb. After the Sabbath, the num a number of women brought spices to the tomb on Sunday morning. To their shock, the stone was rolled away and the tomb was empty. Okay, we're following the story through. Gordon? And from more from the Bible study guide, the resurrection of Christ from the tomb very early on the first day of the week was indispensable to the faith of his followers. Christ must rise from the grave as he had said and as the Old Testament predicted. No evil power could keep him in the ground. At his father's mighty command to rise, the forces of evil were totally vanquished. And wouldn't they have loved to have kept him in the ground? Yeah. Or to say that the disciples stole him was the next idea. Let me just interrupt for just a moment. When Jesus was born, Satan had three goals. Number one, he said, no human being has lived on this world without sinning. I'm going to get this man to sin. He failed in that. As, late, as Jesus went along further and further <coughs> and finally, as he got further along in his life and in his ministry and so forth, Satan said, I may not be able to get him to sin, but I'm going to make, so, make it so difficult for him and the, everything so bad that he'll just say, it's not worth it. I'm going back to heaven. Of course, then I think that would have been an act of selfishness. Yeah. And then that would have been separated sin. him from God. Yeah. And finally... When that didn't work, Jesus is now dead. Satan said, the dead belong to me. I'm going to keep that grave shut. And Satan and all his angels were there to try to keep that grave shut. And? They failed. <laughs> we know what happened. Okay, go ahead. Read again. No evil power could keep him in the ground. At his father's mighty command to rise, the, evil, the, the forces of evil were totally vanquished. The apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 7 states, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Moreover, in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, he continues, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. That's from okay. the Bible study, King James Bible, none total from, yeah. the good, from the teacher's guide. If you had arrived at the tomb early on Sunday morning, before any of the other disciples had arrived, what would you have concluded? Okay, John 20, 8 to 10. Now let's see if we can answer Mickey's question from a few minutes ago. Then the other disciple, that is John, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. He saw and believed. They still did not understand the scripture which said that he must rise from the death, from death. Then the disciples went back home. And our Bible study guide picks up the argument there. Jim? Mary Magdalene was one of those who came early to the tomb. She ran to tell Peter and John what she saw. The two men ran there. John outran Peter and arrived there right first. Stooping down, he looked aside and saw the linen cloths <clears throat> with which Jesus had been wrapped, but he did not go in. Peter, however, went inside and saw the linen cloths lying there. He saw, too, that the face, of, excuse me, that the face cloth that had been on Jesus' head, but did not 
but it was not with the rest of the clause. It was folded up and sitting apart from the Bible study guide. Okay, Jennifer? In the Bible study guide, after Peter entered the tomb, John also entered. From John 20, verse 8, says that he went in, saw, and believed. Why would seeing the grave cloths lying there and the face cloth lying separately folded up lead John to believe Jesus had risen from the dead? To answer this question, it is necessary to ponder why the tomb would be empty in the first place. The most typical answer would be grave robbers. But this explanation fails for three reasons. First, Matthew tells us that the tomb was guarded from Matthew 27, verse 62 to 66, making grave robbery unlikely. Second, grave robbers typically steal valuables, not rotting bodies. <laughs> it's, I'm sorry, but that's, yeah, go ahead. Third, grave robbers are in a hurry and do not fold up grave cloths. No wonder then that when John saw the face cloth folded, he believed that Jesus had risen from the dead. So he said, I know about Jesus and I know he did everything quietly and in order. And there it is. He's alive. Mm. It wasn't a grave robber. Nope. After well, his... Was, it, it, I mean, they said <coughs> the disciples did it, so... Yeah, yeah. Well, he, he, know, he knew, he, John knew it wasn't the disciples who did it. After his resurrection, the first person that we know who actually saw Jesus was Mary. She had been to the tomb, found that it was open, but did not know for sure what had happened. She raced to tell Peter and John they returned to the tomb, followed by Mary. When those two went back to tell the other disciples, Mary lingered at the tomb. She was weeping and crying. She bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels dressed in white. She asked them what they had done with the body of her Lord. Why does it say two angels? Mm. Anybody know who those two angels were? The guardian angels of Jesus. Those were the two guardian angels of Jesus. He, they, they were his guardian angels for his entire life. And one of them was Gabriel. We don't know the name of the other one. Mm. Yeah, Ellen White says that in page, uh, I've forgotten, Desire Pages, about 800 or something. So they were the ones that comforted him in the Garden of Gethsemane? Yep. So I was thinking about this, that imagine the angels being able to help their creator. Yeah. You know, what? Yeah. how did they feel about that? All of them wanted to. Yeah, and yet they were the two that were picked to do it. Mm -hmm. See, so his life. For his whole yeah, life. So, but are we, we're speculating on that or? No, Ellen that's, White says that. Ellen White says that. I should probably put that in here. Yeah, so I missed that. It's in Desire of Ages? Yeah, yeah. Okay, Mary lingered at the tomb. She was weeping and crying. She bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels dressed in white. She asked them what they had done with the body of her Lord. And obviously she, they spoke fluent um, Aramaic. John, John I, I have to chuckle about these kinds of things. John 20, verses 14 to 16. Myra, I think that's yours. Or is it Mickey? Mickey. Then she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who is it you're looking for? <laughs> she thought he was a gardener, so she said to him, if you took him away, sir, tell me where you've put him, and I will go and get him. And she, then, there was an empty tomb not very far away. She said, if you need an empty tomb, I've got one. <laughs> and Jesus then said to her, Mary, she turned toward him and said in Hebrew, Rabboni, this means teacher. Mm. Mary was thrilled to see Jesus. Okay, Myra? 20, 17 and 18. <laughs> Do not hold on to me, Jesus told her, because I have not yet gone back to my father, to the father, but go to my brothers and tell them that I am returning to him who is my father and their father my God and their God. So Mary Magdalene went and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and related to them what he had told her. I think it, it's good. So Maxwell always, in the King James, I think it says, don't touch me. Don't touch me. Yeah. And so Maxwell would explain that 
it's don't detain me, don't yeah. hold me back. Yeah. You know, that the whole plan of salvation depended on not being touched or something about an yeah. excitable woman. Yeah, yeah. No. No. And notice that the Good News Bible gets it right here. Very few versions before that did. The death of Jesus had wide meanings, not only for us on this earth, but also for the rest of the universe, and we need to come back to that. Christ did not, from Ellen White, Desire of Ages, Christ did not yield up his life till he had accomplished the work which he came to do. And what was that? And with his parting breath, he exclaimed, it is finished. The battle had been won. His right hand and his holy arm had gotten him the victory. As a conqueror, he planted his banner on the eternal heights. Was there not joy among the angels? All heaven triumphed in the Savior's victory. Satan was defeated and knew that his kingdom was lost. To the angels and the unfallen worlds, the cry, it is finished, had a deep significance. It was for them as well as for us that the great work of redemption had been accomplished. They with us share the fruits of Christ's victory. And they were not sinners. Oh. Okay, so we have to figure out how to include that idea. Go ahead. Not until the death of Christ was the character of Satan clearly revealed to the angels or to the unfallen worlds. The arch apostate had so clothed himself with deception that even holy beings had not understood his principles. They had not clearly seen the nature of his rebellion. Okay. Page 758. At the time of Lucifer's rebellion and the war in heaven, God could have destroyed Satan and his sympathizers as easily as one can cast a pebble to the earth. But he did not do this. Rebellion was not to be overcome by force. Compelling power is found only under Satan's government. The Lord's principles are not of this order. His authority rests upon goodness, mercy, and love, and the presentation of these principles is the means to be used. God's government is moral, and truth and love are to be the prevailing power. The end result of Jesus... Yeah, sorry, ages 759. Yeah. So this is the chapter, It is Finished. It is finished, which is yeah. after the Calvary. Yeah. So that's a very, it, to me, that chapter is Absolutely. a window into the great controversy. Yep. So just like the first three chapters of Patriarchs and Prophets, this one is a key chapter. In the well, final 30 seconds, Ken. Okay, so what have we seen here? We've seen two things that I want to really emphasize. The death of Jesus was for the benefit of the entire universe. It was to teach truths about God, which even the universe didn't fully understand. They, had, they needed to see how God would respond to rebellion. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is for us to look over your shoulder and see what you accomplished when you were here on this earth. To imagine that you won the war by dying, it doesn't seem possible, but yet we realize that the great truths that were accomplished and were set forward by that experience, in fact, is what sealed the, the fate of Satan and all who followed him. Help us not to make the mistakes of joining ourselves to his side is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen.